narrative art and procedural generation. And I really like to do digital stuff, obviously, but I also really enjoy bringing all my digital artwork uh, into yeah the physical space. And one tool I use, you can see in this picture, uh, is a pen plotter. I'm not sure if you have seen them. They are really, really fun uh, devices. Um, basically, they consist of an X and Y axis, and you can put a pen on there and connect it to your PC, and it will draw whatever you give them. And they are they are sort of the predecessor to currently like to current inkjet plotters, and they were uh, uh, used a lot in, for example, architecture, and also universities to plot graphs and stuff. Uh, and they, it's super interesting to see that they currently have sort of a renaissance in the in the generative art world, and they they get really expensive. If you want to buy new uh, or or used ones, uh, they are still really expensive. And there are also newer versions, like the one I use here. This one is called AxiDraw, really nice machine. And well, uh, when I want to draw something, I need path data. So what I usually work with are SVGs or maybe DXF files. And I when I when I started to get into pen plotting, I stumbled upon yeah, some some problems, and I think I found at least a, a, a interesting quick solution. So when you usually um, generate or or create any sort of SVG, you have uh, you have um, an order of your object. So you can draw a circle and then add a rectangle on top of that, and that circle is partly hidden by that by that square. That's fine. But the problem is when you go to pen plotters. Um, everything is ignored, all the styling is ignored, and also usually the, the order of the shapes uh, is ignored. And then you end up with an image that looks really dif different, like the second line. So you don't have any, any way to hide parts of your shape. And of course, the best thing to do would be some sort of hidden line removal. But at the beginning, when I started pen plotting, that was a bit out of scope. And so I was searching around for super quick ways um, yeah, to cut out parts of a shape so that they at least appear as they were behind another shape. And what really comes in handy here are Boolean operations, uh, I think. And I use, um, when I code my stuff, I usually use Paper.js. It's a really nice JavaScript library for SVG stuff. And it can do Boolean operations for you. And that is like the super quickest thing I found to remove parts of a shape. Problem is, and that's the thing you can see in line three, that um, the segments where shapes touch, you will have the line twice. So your pen will also obviously draw that line twice or multiple times. And that's, that's an effect you might not want to have, but on the other hand, that's also an effect you can utilize. So um, it's yeah, quick, quick and easy way with some drawbacks. And there's some other problematic stuff when you go with pen plotters, like in this project I did a few months ago that was, it was meant, so ignore the text, but uh, ju just look at a picture and it's like, it looks a bit like white noise, like more like dots. And it was meant to be an, um, a bit of an artist outcry for the German government because they really, they really screwed up with their Corona artist help funds. And when you look closely to that image, it's a pen plot uh, consisting of a lot of um, procedurally generated angry middle fingers. And the problem is if you plot some, something like this on a pen plotter, it takes forever. So what you want to do is to do some path optimization. Like you want to have very short travel paths. And that's something you might want to keep in mind when you um, when you generate images for pen plotters, that you, you you can order them yourself to make the yeah to shorten the pl overall pl plot time. And another thing that I that I <laughs> realized the hard way is when you use pen plotters like the modern ones. They usually have a little servo motor to lift up the pen or to let it fall uh, back on the paper. And these servo motors can only handle uh, x times the pen lift, and then they will die. Uh, this usually takes some months, but if you draw something that has so many lines, like the uh, picture like this, uh, you don't want to stress your ser servo too much. So you also want to optimize your picture in a way that it has as less pen lift operations as possible. And that's for this project, the reason that all of these angry fingers consist of only one single line, so that I don't stress my plotter too much. 
And by the way, because Corona is like uh, stressing us all out, I guess if you want to generate your own little angry fingers, you can go to fuck.bibjack.de. There's a generator online. You can make some, some colored version to show the world how fucked up this is sometimes. <laughs> so another project I went into is uh, another machine that is very similar to pen plotters. It's a CNC machine. So it basically works the same way. You have an X and Y axis and you don't put a pen in front of it, but a drilling, a drilling bit or a drilling machine or a, more better a milling machine. <laughs> and I wanted to build a chair and I stumbled upon a paper that was uh, very interesting. And it, it described how you can simulate the rain growth in leaves. And that looked so cool to me. And I thought that's a really nice pattern um, that I can use to decorate my chair because I was searching for a pattern that makes the chair lighter. So it takes out a lot of material, but on the at the same time, it should be, yeah, have enough strength uh, so it can like, <laughs> that the chair won't collapse under my weight and the holes in the pattern shouldn't be too big so that sitting on it uh, still, yeah, still feels good, uh, still feel, feels like um, a proper surface to sit on. So that's what it looks like. I just threw that on my CNC machine. And in this case, I didn't grow that pattern in a leaf-like leaf shape, but more in a, in a square shape. Um, and it took forever. <laughs> this is something I did not really expect that it would uh, take me so long to mill that out. I think one of these parts was about five hours, but I have to say the result was really interesting. And actually it was meant to be my garden chair and it ended up in your museum. That was also very unexpected, but I guess that's how life for artists sometimes goes <laughs> but when you when you go with um procedural generation for wood um you might to yeah you might stumble upon some yeah some complications like at first i tried to make the legs also in the sleeve vein shape and that was my first try that i milled out and as you can see uh, uh, what i'm telling you in this video is that i have some uh, or a lot of actually a lot of problems with the strength of that material because um, these bigger veins don't grow in the way that I was expecting them to grow sort of and I had a problem that the some the part was becoming really wobbly and that would be I think it would be so cool to just throw that in a simulation for for statics uh, that you can find out how to or or that you can uh, alter the growth direction in a way that it will become very, very stable. Uh, but that was a bit out of my scope at that time when I did that project. So have in mind, and if you do procedural generation, you for, for furniture, you uh, want to check if the pattern is stable enough for your furniture part to, to, to yeah, make it work. And another thing that you can see here maybe is the edges of this wood part. They, they look a bit fuzzy and that's mainly caused by my CNC machine, I'd say, because like it's a DIY CNC machine, I guess an industrial one would mill that a lot, a lot better than mine one does, but I had to do all the sanding by hand. And if you choose <laughs> um, a structure that um, yeah, maximizes the surface, you have maximized the surface that you have to sand down by hand. <laughs> and this also takes forever, so maybe, also keep in mind what steps are needed after your main milling process or after your main uh, construction process. In this case, it was sending it down. And in hindsight, I might have just, should have just chosen a bit of a different pattern, but yeah, well, it looks good. And for a one-time project, it's fine, but nothing that you, you could throw onto product, production, right? <laughs> uh, last project I wanted to show is this one. I wanted uh, to make something yeah, with the space theme. So we can see some planets, some stars for decoration, different variations. The rocket is flying on there and you have some swirly patterns in the background. And I wanted to play with a very new material for me. So I uh, took my generator and my generator output and slapped that on a PCB board. And here, that's what our first rendering looks like. And PCBs are a super fun material to, uh, to use. And uh, that's something I just recently learned how to, how to make PCBs. I'm not sure if you, if you have never had a PCB in your hand, they, they work a bit like a sandwich. So in the middle, you have a core of fiber optics or fiber like fiberglass. 
Uh, and then sandwiched around, you have two layers of copper on the top and bottom and around that. You have a coating, that's the, one, uh, the coating you can see in blue here, which is called solar mask. So it will cover everything except the contacts. And on that solder mask, um, you can usually do some sort of uh, screen print, either in white or black usually. And then on the contacts that are open to the air, there's usually uh, a finish on it. In this case, I went with uh, a golden finish. So there's really gold particles on that that makes it really like neat, neat to look at and neat to handle. And when you work with PCBs, uh, PCB plates as a material, you can do really fun stuff as you see with the swirls. You can combine different layers to get uh, different sort of, sort of effects. So the swirls in the background, um, I left copper, uh, like copper traces on there. And then when the solder mask goes over that, you get a nice relief structure. And you can also see that the blue tones get a variation from a darker, um, yeah, a darker blue tone to a lighter blue tone. And then there's also the stars. This, these are parts where I uh, left everything off the board, basically. So that's just a fiber core. And if you put them against the sun, they look really nice. So you can achieve a very, very nice and interesting um, way to make them lightable from the backside. So the light will go through very nice through the stars and also nicely through the swirls and give, uh, the swirls get a bit of a blue tint. And well, I put them onto production and, uh, <laughs> and gave, uh, gave my files to a PCB manufacturer. So I didn't make them myself, uh, of course. And um, I have to say they, they were a bit surprised of what I was asking for because that's like not the usual thing that a PCB might when you, uh, that you would ask a manufacturer something like how is the blue looking the, will the blue be the same on every board um, can you please check that there are no scratches on the PCBs and uh, questions like this they were a bit surprised about that but I handled it super well so far um, but there are other things that I uh, made right by accident. So when you look at this uh, set of boards, you can see that the uh, electronic parts and the traces, they stay the same. And in this case they do because I was a bit afraid to generate the traces. So um, I laid them out in a usual uh, PCB, PCB tool. Um, I use KiCad, it's like the go-to open source tool for PCB design. So I made them like, like every regular PCB would, would have been designed. Um, and so, and that's the reason why they stay the same for each board. And in hindsight, that were, uh, was a really good decision because when you ask manufacturers to produce your board, they will use stencils um, to uh, apply solder to your board and then place the parts. And they said the stencils, they look a bit like a super thin sheet of metal with punched out holes that fit your contacts and then they apply like solder similar to screen printing, for example, like it's a paste and they just scrub it on the surface. And um, the stencil also has to get manufactured. And so I could use the same stencil for every board. That is super good because otherwise the boards would have exploded in price. And that's the next thing, right? Because when you, when you order PCBs, they, they get really cheap when you order a lot of PCBs, but for procedural generation or for generative art, it's cool to have like small amounts because you want to show that variety that your procedural generation algorithm can produce. And so the nice like middle, gold middle way that I chose was to order 10, 10 pieces for each design so that it, it, the price drops at least a bit, um, but I can uh, order um, lots of different designs or enough designs that I have fun showing them around and, and say, look, they, they all are cool and look different. And of course, um, the boards also have a functionality. So as you can see, they have a USB-C port, so you can just connect them to your PC and program them like a typical Arduino board or also program them with CircuitPython. And the three plants that you can see here are capacitive touch buttons. So you can yeah use the board similar to a regular keyboard, or basically you can program everything you want, but that's the main intention to use it as an additional keyboard for, I don't know, muting, or when you do live streaming, you can switch um, uh, scenes and something. It also has a teeny tiny RGB LED to give some notification lights. And there was some something for me a bit unexpected because I'm not too deep into electronics or like physics and electronics maybe. 
um, is that when you do capacitive touch buttons, um, the, capac the, the value that is read out by the microchip uh, depends a lot on the shape of your button. So in this case, you can see I have these suns in the middle. So there's sun, a sun with one ring and a sun with three rings. And the values that I read out, they change drastically. <laughs> so when I uploaded um, an example sketch for, for my boards, uh, the first response I got was, oh, that's not working for me at all. And I was like, oh, wait, what? And then I, uh, yeah, I tested, uh, tested some boards and realized that it, yeah, it, it just depends a lot uh, what, what the actual shape is. Uh, and now, now my code has a comment on top that says like, please, please check your own values because for each board that you, that you get, uh, this might, might be very drastic different value. So that's something to keep in mind when you do generative PCB designs, a lot of like threshold values will change in the code. And, but overall, it's a very, very fun, very fun project. And I really want to continue working with PCBs. They are a fascinating material for me. And these were the three projects I wanted to show you today. If uh, you can, of course, now ask questions. I think we have enough time. But if uh, you want to ask me in private, you can find me under bleed track on basically every social media page. And if you want to look up that slides again, you can find them at uh, EPC21 bleep track DE. So I guess we are ready for questions now. Thank you very much, Sabina. I think it's uh, I think it's very clear that the uh, next purchase for the school is a is a pen plotter. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I think that <laughs> we'll have to find a way to to get one of those. Uh, thank you very much. That was that was that was lovely, and I can I can already see the the chat is exploding. So that's fantastic to hear, and I think that we are ready to to take uh, to take questions. And as I as I mentioned, we do have right now full twelve minutes for questions, which is amazing. Uh, so raise your raise your hands, and I think that yes, mine will give you the will will unmute mute you and give you the. The mic to ask your own questions and let's see how that works in practice. Hello. Hey, hey. Hi. I would like to know if you have some procedural content for three D printing. Uh, actually, not yet. I started to dig into uh, Blender for three D generation, but I don't have much experience there, to be honest. So that's something I hope to explore more this year, or maybe next year. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, one question. I worked with the uh, pen plotter and uh, Houdini, and uh, always uh, was like a nightmare to to have the correct path uh, uh, for pen for pen plotter. Do you have some suggestions about uh, uh, the workflow, uh, like from Houdini to the pen plotter? Uh, to be honest, not really from Houdini because I usually start with my own generated SVGs through Paper.js. But what, hmm, but what I have seen is that at least I know there are some interesting wireframe exports from Blender. That's what I know of. I'm not, sure, but I guess that something similar might be available for Houdini, where you at least can get nice wireframe exports. But I'm also not sure if, if that's something you're after. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I have seen, uh, I have heard that from Blender, it's much easier. Uh, I, I wrote uh, something with Python to export from Udini, but uh, yeah, uh, you use, uh, you say the paper? Uh, Paper.js, that's a okay. JavaScript, JavaScript okay. library, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you too.
Hello, Sabine. Thank you. Hey. Um, I noticed uh, you mentioned the servos that gave you a bit of trouble. Have you thought about uh, adding solenoids instead of the servos for the plotter? Yeah, that's, that's a perfect idea. Um, I started building my own plotter some time ago and then scrapped it because I ran out of, <laughs> sort of ran out of time. And that's that's where I wanted to to add solenoids because I think they are the way better. They, they do Maybe. work. I, I put a pen on a 3D printer using a solenoid mm -hmm. for the up and down lift and it works nicely. So I think that's so, the way to go. Um, mm -hmm. Do you one, only lift it up or is it pressing? It's, it's two states. Down or up. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but you can basically uh, um, use it like a servo with any ah. value above zero is uh, off or on. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's the thing that I, that I wanted to ask you. Like, do you do you use the solenoid to lift it up or do you use the solenoid oh, to press um, it down? I, I prefer it to have the, uh, the string I use uh, to mm -hmm. disconnect the pen from the paper. So you don't right. actually mm -hmm. uh, accidentally drop the pen on the paper if something goes wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. ah, that, that's a good that's a good way to go. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the procedural geometry generation, um, I used op uh, uh, VDB, OpenVDB, for the actual um, generation of the mm -hmm. mesh. That works nicely because you can basically push any kind of even strange geometry in, but you get a mesh out that is closed and works for three D printing. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you again. Cool. Thanks. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can hear me. I hope. Hey, uh, I have a question. I've done uh, a procedural generation digitally a lot in, in work, but I'm just curious, what do you think are the biggest challenges or differences when doing a lot of physical stuff? I think the biggest challenge is maybe to find out what your, like your end result uh, has uh, what what constraints it has, uh, right? Because like if you do something for a pen plotter, you want to consider some very pen plotter dependent stuff. So I think that is yeah, it depends a lot on what what way you want to go. And I also guess that's the fun part, right? Because you can experiment a lot with that material or that process. So it's it's hard to give a good a good suggestion to you, to be honest, because it's it's just so different depending on what you want to do. Thank you. Hello. Hey. Um, so just out of curiosity, how much does a PCB cost if you only buy 10 of them? <laughs> um, they end up to be $9 currently. And that is sounds still super expensive. And it sort of is. But the problem is that the chip that I use, that's an SAMD 21, they are super expensive. And they are getting more and more expensive. I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> Um, but they are they are they are quite powerful, uh, especially compared to classic Arduino uh, MCUs. So that's what that, I guess that's the part that makes the whole board m mainly expensive. Yeah, but they end up to be nine dollars when I when I buy them from the manufacturer. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, hey. I've. It's it's interesting. That obviously, you're working with an artistic community, and you work with a lot of digital generation, and a lot of traditional artists are very about handcrafting each thing individually. Have you had any sort of feedback from more kind of traditional communities who kind of resent that you're using procedural generation? Uh, do you do you kind of understand what I'm getting to here? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um... I don't, uh, to be honest, there maybe was not too much feedback from from the artistic community, but um, uh, I had that photo where I put where the chair was uh, exhibited in a mm. museum, and it was my first solo exhibition, and I did a lot of uh, tours through that exhibition. So I had a lot of people coming in the museum who had no connections to neither digital art nor uh, generative art or procedural art, mm. and it was a bit hard to explain them what the what the focus is or what the what the fun part maybe is on procedural generation. 
Mm. And they they got it quite nicely, I think. There were very few people who were still confused, maybe. <laughs> um, but I think overall the um, the response was very positive. And what so my my point of view is, I think, a very uh, similar point of view to the most of you attendees today, because you come from 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 uh, from from uh, game from mm. game design, mm -hmm. where when you do a procedural process. You want to tweak it in a way that it makes interesting parts, but also has a large variety. So you try to find that golden middle, I'd say, um, and you don't necessarily curate the outcomes. At least I, I'd say that. And this is also my point of view. So I like to build generators, and I usually put them online, like the fact that if you check the e-page where people can play around with it. And but I've also met a lot of other generative artists who have a very different point of view on their art. So it's not not the project and all, uh, in, in an as a whole thing that they value, but they they curate a lot what their generator does. So they don't don't tweak it too much. They they code it in a way, and then they generate maybe two hundred pictures or something, and then they curate five ones out of that that they yeah. find interesting. That's what they publish. So I think they are very different point of views to that and what what people find value in or not value in or what they think is the art part or not yeah i think it's interesting obviously trying to look at um kind of museums and galleries and and how they respond to generative art um and obviously like you say there's kind of some artists have that kind of curatorship kind of idea of their own work compared to uh, uh people who just kind of go this is all of these pieces are valid no it's interesting thank you yeah thank, mm -hmm. and thank you for your talk today Okay, I think we went through all the, the questions and that's exactly on, on time. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and uh, thank you everyone for, for that lovely Q&A. So I, I, it was interesting as well to, to hear uh, ideas going both ways, right? So I, I like the solenoid thing. Maybe it will, it will help you solve your server problem that it, you can get more mileage out of your, <laughs> out of your equipment. Um, uh, I think that for the for the next for the next talks we can also we can also try to 